Our next guest is going to be in our fair city for a show at the Kimmel Cultural Campus, the Kimmel Center, uh, September 23rd. And it is called An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies Part 2. I love this. Please welcome one of our all-time favorite guests, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. This hey morning. Guys. Neil, hey. good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, I like the fact that whoever is watching this rather than just listening, each of you has your name emblazoned <laughs> on the moon of your microphone. Yes. Yeah. That was Preston's idea. He thought it had almost like the way you put thought into things. Uh, he did as well. So, <laughs> well, Were you guys stealing each other's microphones? And then, like, <laughs> no, it's actually for the purpose. And so it's so the guest knows uh, how to refer to us. Sometimes you come into a room and you have all these people and you mm. want to be polite. Oh, uh, very good. And there you go. So, Hey, very Neil, we, we played the 2001 uh, music as we were leading. In. Do you have do you have a favorite space theme piece of music? Because you're brought on all the time, and I'm sure that that people will use some music to. Yeah, set I mean, the you know, there's there's no substitute for 2001, but uh, you, I think Bowie's Space Oddity is <sighs> has got to be up there. Yeah. You know, uh, it, many people misname it as Major Tom or whatever, but yeah, Space Oddity, uh, that's a good one. But yeah, I think 2001 wins. Uh, well, well also Sprach Zarathustra. Right, yeah, yeah. that's Space yes. Zarathustra. Yes. Yeah, they, they uh, and I love this whole thing. We're all fans, obviously, of of all your work. But when you start talking movies, you're extra in our real house. Yep. <laughs> and I was reading something you uh, wrote, uh, and it concerned time travel, which is a common uh, theme in movies. Yeah, and yeah. you raised this notion that blew my mind, and I never thought about this before. So, like, uh, for example, in the classic uh, George Powell uh, time, uh, the Time Machine, uh, Rod Taylor, if you travel, th if you travel through time, it also has to be a space travel as well, because if yes. you travel through time and go back, the Earth will have moved. <laughs> you'll be in the vacuum of space, correct? Uh, yes. Uh. <laughs> Did, uh, did you ever think about I that, Preston? I never thought about that. That's, it has to involve time point. and travel, correct? Mm -hmm. And space travel, correct. Yeah. Because, other, yeah, I mean, just think about it. Earth is moving pretty fast at a good clip in orbit around the Earth. Yeah. And if you just sit there and say, <laughs> I'm going to go back an hour, um, yeah, no, that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Plus, Earth is it's also rotating. Yes. And the sun, with all of its orbiting objects, it is dragging them with it in orbit around the center of the galaxy. Yes. And the galaxy yes. is falling towards <laughs> another galaxy in the constellation Andromeda, all right, the Andromeda galaxy. So all this motion is happening, and you'll just be bare-assed in space. <laughs> with, you don't all include a space coordinate with your time machine. By the way, in, in Back to the Future, they kind of were okay about that, maybe just by accident, because... They went. He went back exact in the original. Went back exactly thirty years. Okay. So, if, if you go back an exact year count, ah. then it, in terms of Earth's orbit, he's good. But the sun moving around the galaxy, he wouldn't be. But okay. you got to, you know, you can't, you can't require everything. <laughs> no, but I know, it, and I assume you do a fair amount of. And I, I say this uh, with all these movies, and I, I love seeing your uh, take on the uh, the science and the efficacy of what's put forward in, in these various films. But you do have to allow for, you know, uh, certain things, and you sort of check your brains at the door on some aspects of it. But, but to your to your uh, thinking to this day. What movie? What movie stands head and shoulders above the rest as far as nailing the science? Okay, let me start first. Which which one does worst? <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Armageddon. <laughs> That's how much you hate it. More laws of physics <laughs> per minute. Okay. Than any other movie ever made. <laughs> it's a staggering piece of crap. <laughs> no, no, no. I just no. It's entertaining. Uh -huh. It's funny. Yeah. It's got good relationships. It's got good stars. We like watching the stars. So, so I, I don't. I, I don't. I barely even comment on that. But there's a scene where there's an early wave of of of. Uh, meteors, uh, yeah. uh, comet parts that are coming in before the big one comes. Right. And just, just as one little point, one of them hits like Grand Central Terminal <laughs> in New York City, goes through and destroys the clock in the middle of the waiting room. <laughs> You're thinking, you have GPS aim. You know, most of the earth is ocean. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, what kills me. Take out our monuments with yeah. these things. But uh, I would say uh, 
probably the most accurate is The Martian. I knew it. Ah. I knew it. I wrote down. I wrote down Andy Weir <laughs> yes. because yes, he wrote Weir the book. And- the book is phenomenal, by the way. And he handed me the highest compliment I've ever gotten. He said when he was writing that, because he, he's also an engineer turned novelist. He was said when he was writing it, he said, hmm, I wonder what Tyson would tweet about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, he doesn't want to be called out for getting anything wrong. I thought that was a, I was, it was a little version of me on his shoulder. So, Neil, have you, have you read uh, Project Hail Mary uh, from him yet? No, but I know of the storyline. Yes, and it, we chatted about that. That's a very intriguing, very sort of biological um, uh, concept that he's got going there. And they're going to make that into a movie. Ryan Gosling is going yeah, to well, star I mean, in that. Of course, yeah, and it is. Sure. Uh, I I absolutely fell in love with that book, and I'm so glad because the science was some of the most intriguing. Uh, the way it's explained, he does in a very um, uh, a, a very uh, approachable, a, a plain way that that uh, us that uh, we that don't have degrees can uh, can follow along with, and uh, I can't wait for that to be a film as well. But even The Martian did take some some liberties as well, did it not? Yeah, there's one. It took one liberty. By the way, there's a Mark Twain quote which I'll share with you. It's first get your facts straight then distort them at your leisure. Mm. <laughs> so, so, I don't mind you going interesting places with your storytelling, provided you did a little homework. That's okay. all. Okay. That's, that's, that's it. I'm not nit- that's all? Yeah, that's, no, that's I agree. It's like I will... Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so so <clears throat> the... Um, so what was I saying? With... Uh, the Martian. Um, One thing. The, uh, one thing with, with there, there was there was one thing there was one thing in the Martian you said that that Although they that, took a little sorry, bit of liberty. Yeah. One thing. So here it is. So the reason why they left uh, Mark Watney, uh, Matt Damon behind was a storm was kicking up. You know, Martian dust storms are famous, right? They yeah. can cloak the surface of the planet, and so and they give them up for dead, and then they take off so that they don't topple over. All right. Pause. <laughs> the atmosphere of Mars is one one hundredth the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> so one hundred mile an hour winds on Mars is like someone gently not have rocked the spaceship. Uh, <laughs> okay, right. So I told this to Andy, and he said, "Yeah, I know, but I needed some mechanism, so I'll give it to him because of how much other science he got right." Okay. Uh, there's there's a film, and, and uh, if, if you don't mind, we can point out a couple and ask you a question about it. And, and I thought it was a pretty good movie, but they they really took some liberties with um, with motion. Uh, was the movie Gravity with uh, Sandra Bullock? Oh, oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, they did a lot of good stuff. Yes, and they did a lot. But then when I saw it, I saw a preview IMAX of it, and then I dropped fifteen tweets about it saying. Um, problems with gravity or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, so a, a, a simple one, all right, is Sandra Bullock's bangs <laughs> always pointed downwards. <laughs> You're weightless. The first thing you notice about astronauts with loose hair is that their hair is just floating up. Yeah. And I thought, give me a little bang floating, okay? Uh-huh. Now, am, am I, maybe I'm being picky. I don't know. Um, and so, but there's some beautiful things done. There's a point where she tears up and the tear comes off her cheek. Yeah. And it floats towards the camera. And you see her image inside the tweet, uh, like a, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm the inside tear? the tear. Yeah. Because it's like a little bit of a lens. And no, so there's a lot of brilliant stuff that took place in it. But, uh, but so when I criticized it, I criticized it because I cared about the movie. Mm. The movies I would never criticize because, no, I'm not going there. Like, Mars attacks. <laughs> no. That <laughs> wouldn't be, okay? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's meant completely for just, just to be digested as as, as popcorn fodder. and, and you popcorn, enjoy, exactly. Right, you enjoy exactly. it on that level. I wanted to ask you, because it was just on again, and I think it's an intriguing movie, uh, The uh, Arrival. Which is the the alien encounter where they're trying to work on language between this species that is so yeah. absolutely remote and foreign to us. Yes. Is there is there a protocol? <laughs> I don't even know if this exists. For what if there is an encounter someday? And I it, to me to my line of thinking, you would probably be more inclined to want to have scientists there doing that than because they always send. 
linguistics experts and things yeah, like that. So, so uh, correct. So I, I, I'm very familiar with the film, and it was an intriguing concept. Right. Okay. But I, I, I tweeted about this too. I said, you know, if I'm trying to talk to aliens, I probably wouldn't send a physicist and a linguist. I'd send an astrobiologist and a cryptographer. Okay. Then all the linguists beat, up, beat me on the head. And I, I realized how often is there ever a linguist in a movie? So I should have given them their time, and you know, I should have let that one slide. You know, that was just not that it was mean spirited, but I should have really let that one go. But here, here's a, here's a point. There's the 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 septipod, all right, uh, painting circular patterns on the window, and they're taking it and interpreting it. At no time do they ask themselves. Um, is this backwards? <laughs> ah. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. I mean, they don't ask themselves that. And I thought that would have been an interesting little thing to, because it's communicating through, you know, through ink, uh, ink squirts on a window. And it's looking in one direction. They're huh. looking in the other with switches <laughs> left and right. right. That never came up. Right. Okay? Right. And to, to a cryptographer, that would have come up. I'm just saying. Well, I don't mean it to be like that. <laughs> Star Trek, and, and, and I'm a massive science fiction nerd, and and the um, they they always seem to when they're looking to communicate, they're looking for the, the common um, recognition of sort of the immutable laws of the universe, or or, or carbon, or or you know mathematics, mathematics. Yeah, yeah. D doesn't that seem the 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 better point of entry to communicate with? Completely, yeah. completely, <laughs> right? Okay. You know, if the aliens come here, then, you know, they're not going to be speaking Mandarin or English. You know, <laughs> right. they're going to if, if they will, they should know that whatever language they want to communicate in, it's got to be something that applies across the universe. Right. And it's not linked to some cultural evolution in the path in the movement of languages across Earth's surface by migratory early humans. Right. So what's universal? It'll be laws of physics and mathematics, mathematics itself, the language of the universe. Mm. But what I want to add here is that every movie you've mentioned has been science fiction. I would say in my talk, the astrophysicist goes to the movie, the sequel, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because there's a whole other one, by the way. <laughs> yeah. In that talk, I would say two thirds of the movies are not science fiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that when someone makes, quote, a regular movie and they put in some intriguing science. Here's one for you Monsters Inc. Okay. okay? You say, well, where's the science in that? It was brilliant. Oh my gosh. The monsters uh, work in a factory that creates doors. Doors, and it is the door of the closet of the kids' room <laughs> that they're going to bust out and scare overnight. Mm -hmm. So all they have to do is open the closet door and they show up in the kids' closet. This door is a four dimensional portal through the space time continuum. And this is exactly what 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 um, Doctor Strange is doing. Uh -huh. Yes, Doctor Strange needs magic and sparkly <laughs> hole openings, right? <laughs> and with the monsters just walk through the door. <laughs> this was completely brilliant, and they didn't make a big deal of it. And it's like, so I will praise even animated features. I love when it when they when they think about it and they do it right. Okay. I also love the fact, uh, Dr. Tyson, that you've been tweeting uh, about the moon quite a bit lately, and I'm, I, I think you are probably as well, but everybody in this room is very excited about the Artemis mission, and, um, I, you know, I don't know if, if and when it's going to happen, but, and I was a little upset with the scrub a, a week or two ago. Um, what are your thoughts on Artemis and, and what it's, uh, you know, going to let us know about the moon? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm of two minds there. I'm, I say to myself, yeah, I'm glad we're going back to the moon. 50 years later. Yeah. yeah. Come on. <laughs> I mean, if you had said in 1972, we're going to have a space mission in the year 2022, you're going to say, where's it going? Right. Are we sending people to Jupiter? <laughs> to, to, yeah. No, uh, we're going to go back to the moon. <laughs> and this first mission won't have people on it. Right. All right. Neither will the second mission. Okay. And I don't even know. I have to remember if the third mission, if they're ever going to even land. So you got to be a little bit disappointed that we've had this 50 year gap. That being said, we have landed on Mars. We plunked a, an SUV sized rover down on Mars. Yeah. That's getting 3D and it had a helicopter. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So the science has progressed, not the sort of the geopolitics of human exploration of the solar system. Right. So that's why I'm, I'm of two minds there. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. By the way, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. 
Oh, in case you didn't there we go. The yes. Apollo mission was the right. first uh, to go to the moon. Yeah. Isn't that great? Oh, I get Wait, it. did you have to explain? Are they that young? You had to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question about the moon. So last Saturday, uh, it was uh, slightly overcast, but the, the clouds seemed to be thin. You could see the moon through it. And it looked like what was, I guess, a reflection of the moon just a little bit away and down a little bit further. Was that, is that what I was looking at? A reflection? Okay, now what you get, oh, it's interesting. No, no, what you get is, depending on what the, what the clouds are made of, if they're, uh, and how big the droplets of, of moisture in the clouds, and occasionally, they're, when you go high up, it gets very cold. You may have noticed in an airplane, if you look at the screen that tells you the outdoor temperature, it's like 40 below zero when you get high up. Okay, so, uh, and if the droplets freeze, then they become little prisms, and they, they'll actually reflect the, uh, the moonlight into an angle that would be, what would be a way you would find a rainbow. Sometimes you see a moon bow oh. as well, but mm -hmm. the, depending on where the water is, it'll be like 22 degrees away from where the moon is. And these are spots where the, the light comes back to you again. It's an optical effect in the clouds. You need clouds for that. That's you know, cool. Just, just slightly transparent clouds. Now that my mind is reeling from Monsters, Inc., I, I, I want to <laughs> ask you about... Um, so the, to me... It, would would that be similar to perhaps uh, a controlled wormhole, like I created? Yes, in yes, completely, completely. And there's a scene in Monsters Inc. It's a chase scene where they're chasing each other in the factory through doors. And so you go through a door, and in one door it, they end up with the Eiffel Tower in in Paris, and another one there. And and so so it's somebody thought about that. And it's Pixar, basically. So I think they have authentic scientists in, in Pixar. There's another one in in A Bug's Life. Hold aside the fact that the ants all had only four legs. Okay, right. uh, you know, they got the physics right, even if they cheated the biology. A mosquito is in a bar ordering a drink. And if you're a mosquito, what drink would you order? Blood. A Bloody blood. Mary. Bloody Mary, yeah. yeah. No, Bloody Mary. There's a real bar. So it's a Bloody Mary, please. Uh -huh. Not yeah. blood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> duh. so the bartender, the bartender has a dispenser and he pulls out a blob of Bloody Mary, which is just a little blob and he places it on the counter. Oh my gosh, they know about surface tension. Surface tension, yeah. This because when you're really little, you don't need a highball glass. Yeah. Just put the dot of liquid in front of you. <laughs> yeah. And wow. then the mosquito um, sucks it and then it gets <laughs> high from it and falls off the bar stool. <laughs> so uh, the, I applaud any place there's a little bit of science that's that's intriguing. And, and there's another example in Steve Martin's um uh uh Steve Martin's uh, LA story. Yes. You know, in the old days, if you wanted to know how much time elapsed, there'd be a calendar on the wall and you would see days flip by or the the hours go by on a clock. He he had a different mechanism in it. He had the moon going through its phases just in the background in the sky. Uh -huh. And so I, you can tell, OK, this story took place over two weeks. OK, because it started at a crescent moon and it ended up with a full moon. And I thought that was brilliant. I said, like, yes, yes. Give me some universe help in the storytelling. However, the the crest the, the crest <laughs> oh, was no. growing in the wrong direction. There you oh, go. Man. There you go. Okay. Uh, but I got to I got to give him a shout out for even going there. You got James Cameron to um, re uh, cor uh, to correct a uh, sky scene in Titanic. Um, yeah. uh, have you ever had anything uh, that to me seems like a a huge impact on cinema history? Have you ever <laughs> uh, affected a post? Uh, release change in a film outside of that. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. So, so uh, by the way, I only did that because I'm, I remember the Titanic in first release. Right. All the marketing for it was uh, a camera went to the bottom of the ocean with mm -hmm. oceanographer Robert Ballard. They found the Titanic. They filmed the the rivets, the 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 state rooms, the china patterns, and they reproduced it in meticulous detail. Right. We know the date, the time, where the uh, the location where the Titanic sank. We know there was no moon that night, yeah. and it was clear. So when Rose is looking up deliriously on the plank, there's only one sky she should have seen, <laughs> and it was the wrong sky. <laughs> it was not only the wrong sky. The left half was a mirror reflection of the right half. Uh. It was wrong and lazy. <laughs> oh, my God. Let that go. I spent 10 years trying to get this boy to fix that. And so in his re-release, his yeah. centennial re-release in 2012, they recut it 
because they called me and said, you got a sky we could use. And so I did that. In another example, Seth MacFarlane for Ted called me up and said, there's a scene where our main character is looking out the window. There's a there's a meteor streak. This is when he wishes on on the meteor so that the, 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 the bear comes to life. Right. He says, I want to make sure the sky is accurate. So... I don't read about it the next morning. <laughs> so I gave him the sky. And the funny part was, if you look at the, the scoring at that point would have been Ted one, Titanic zero. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah, Ted had accurate skies in it. By the That's way. cool. Uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to be at the Kimmel Center uh, September 23rd for an astrophysicist goes to the movies. This is the sequel, part two. Um, you know, another uh, a show... Uh, that I think has uh, touched on quite a bit of science, along with a lot of horror and science fiction, uh, is Stranger Things. And I don't know if you uh, spent any time with that or not, because they cover electromagnetics and things like that uh, pretty extensively. Yeah, so I've never binged the entire series, but I've caught enough episodes to get a feeling for it. And it's quite intriguing. And the fact that they have kids in it, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, um, what it does is it makes you think twice about what could be going on around you. Mm. And 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 it, it 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 forces you it forces you and encourages you to notice things that you might not have otherwise paid attention to. So I applaud where they were headed there. And so yeah, I had a very successful show. Okay. I know it was a long time ago in a galaxy far far away, um yeah. but uh would the physics of Star Wars hold up like would the Death Star explode the way that it exploded or would it because you can't have a fire like that in okay, space. Okay, let's get this straight. There is no physics in Star Wars. Just <laughs> <laughs> start there. Okay, start there. So I'll mention two, th two, two bits of physics. Ready? In the original Star Wars, I call it Star Wars 1, but yeah. it's probably, what is it? Four. 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 Episode yeah. 4, yeah. okay? Um, Luke comes out on the sand planet, and he's looking at the double sunset. I said, yes! Do you know more than half the stars you see in the night sky? If you pull out a telescope, they will resolve into multiple, double and multiple star systems. Huh. So I said, somebody finally captured this in cinema. And so I thought that was a brilliant addition to that storytelling. And it's one of the more poignant scenes in the film. It's beautiful, right? yeah. It, it, it doesn't move the plot or anything. It's just a poignant moment. In episode seven, uh, <laughs> The Force Awakens, they have the new and improved powerful Death Star that sucks all the energy out of a real star so that it can kill multiple planets at once. <laughs> this is especially diabolical. Okay, so I did the math on that. First, if you suck all the energy out of a star, you become a star. But let's assume they have special modern containing devices. All right, so then they have these beams and they destroy all, all the planets of a star system. I said, do you realize that had they calculated this right, the energy of a star is enough to destroy a thousand planets, <laughs> okay? So this is a case where they tried to do a little bit of science, but had they done it correctly, they could have told a more fascinating story. Mm. And the force, the dark, the dark side would have been even more powerful. But well, another thing about that, if you're a military uh, commander, why do you want to completely obliterate the planet? Don't you want the planet? <laughs> sure. Oh, just get rid of the people. Yeah. Just, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> what do you got against the planet? The yeah. planet can not do anything to you. Yeah, oh, I would imagine real estate was valuable even right. in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. That's why Independence yeah. Day is to, to me that they're 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 incinerating the planet that they've supposedly come to take over and mine for resources, right? So, but they're they're decimating everything. A lot of times, well, not I, the whole planet. They're killing all of you know the White House. So they're killing yeah, all. They're yeah. trying to destroy Los Angeles. We need <laughs> yeah, to yeah, sustain yeah. civilization. By the way, something they didn't tell you. In, in in Independence Day, that movie is precisely H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh -huh. Because uh, how did we destroy the aliens in War of the Worlds? Uh, it was uh, the, the virus. It was a virus. How did we destroy the aliens in Independence Day? It was a computer virus. virus. Yeah. Yeah. A virus, you see? All right, so <laughs> let me ask you this. This has always bothered me. Story. You have yeah. these super evolved aliens that make it all the way across. They're, they're traveling. They're destroying planets. They've got this incredible tech. And they're using um, a Mac OS. That, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds yeah, that I you saw, could I have? I comment on that longer. I said, you know, I can't. But at the time, yeah. it was very hard to move files back and forth between computers. There was huge challenges related to that. And so I just said, 
my gosh, they can like put an active virus from a Mac into <laughs> an event. This, so that was the least believable part. Right. But another one was they, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they got the, they captured the alien spaceship, okay, figured out how to work it, and then they get in it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. This is a seat with a headrest. Did the, did the aliens have a seat? With the headrest? Right, it's true. Uh, there was a, what was the uh, Casey the uh, and Steve anybody who can answer the 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 M Night Shyamalan movie with the aliens signs signs, signs. okay. Yeah. I've heard people um, that have kind of uh, uh, given that no, movie I didn't a hard see that movie. Forgive me on that one. But wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I, I, the point I was going to make is is the these aliens come here and it turns out that water is is acid uh, to them is acid to them and I, and I've heard the argument of well why would you even go to a planet where it's mainly water and it would be like acid to you <laughs> stupid but then, aliens <laughs> but then again we as humans we put ourselves our our explorers in. Uh, extremely hostile environments all the time as we're exploring as yeah, well. Yeah, but we know in advance and we prepare for it. Right. Oh, by the way, this idea that water is caustic to them, we, we already have experienced that in film, right? Uh, in Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Who would have thought that the Wicked Witch of the West was water soluble? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to, to that point, the Wizard of Oz and, and other movies that are more fantastical, say like Harry Potter and so on and so forth, and, and they, they make the point in, and Marvel Comics was doing it for years with Thor and Asgard, is that it is simply science and technology that appears to be magic to us. Hmm. Does that hold you know, any? That's the famous Arthur C. Clarke. Edict. Right. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and so that that's clearly the case. They right. Have no, no doubt about that. Although, um, I, I think Doctor Strange is actually using magic. Right. Okay. He needed these magic movements of his hands and things. Uh, oh, by the way, in Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Oz is in this talk. Oh. At, at the Kimmel Center. Um, I guess I'll give it away. Uh, when I was a kid, and I, you know, we all saw Wizard of Oz as a, as a kid. At the end, when they give the scarecrow the brain, do you yes. remember what yes. he does when he, as evidence that he's got a brain? He does a mathematical equation. In that moment. Does name? Yes, he does. Yes. And I said, wow, I can't wait till I'm old enough to understand that mathematical <laughs> equation. <laughs> then the, the, the minute I got old enough and I heard that mathematical, it's like, no! Oh, it's no. Wrong. It's, it's wrong. wrong. I think he says hypotenuse he in it at some point. He quotes the Pythagorean theory. <laughs> oh. yeah. And I thought, they could have called a local math teacher from, you know, middle school. <laughs> totally could have. <laughs> Do you want to, here's a, here's a fun fact I just learned about the Wizard of Oz. When they're running through the poppy fields and it starts snowing, yeah. apparently they used ground-up asbestos <gasps> to no. create. That's oh, correct. Yeah. My God. oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, asbestos. It's very light and airy and, yeah. No, yeah. Oh <laughs> wow. So you live, you learn. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Tyson, I'm driving across the country next week, and, uh, and I'm, so I'm going to have a lot of time on my hands, and you have a new book that is being released on Tuesday. Is there an audio version of that book? Yes, there is. Thanks for calling that out. In fact, I narrate the audio book of it, and it's called A Starry Messenger, ah. Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Hmm. So it's what you all look like to somebody who has a cosmic view and who's scientifically literate. And it goes to all manner of places within our warring factions of society. So I start out with truth and beauty and then a uh, 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 color and race. Yeah, I went there. Yeah. And gender and identity. There's there's conflict and resolution, risk and reward, life and death. And uh, oh, and also. Um, uh, 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 law and order. It's what all this looks like because w w this, the, as soon as I was scientifically literate, uh, starting about age 12, I said, what are these adults doing? <laughs> what, yeah, yeah, doing? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are they doing? And this is collected. It's been gestating within me huh. my entire life. And this is my gift to civilization so that they will know what you look like to science. It's the lens, really. So thanks. If you to, to totally pop it in the you know, totally the audiobook of perfect for driving across the country. All right. Love so it. I don't know how long the book is to listen to, but how long did it take for you to record it? Uh two days. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's oh. the book. The actual book is two hundred pages. It's not a big oh, fat book. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't, you know, the whole, I don't read fat books. So <laughs> I want to make sure it's it's at arm's reach. And the book is a smaller format, you know, size. So uh there's a lot in there. Uh it's it's just chock full of such Excellent. Yeah, I have a fast observation. Uh, oh, there's a chapter, Meat Eaters and Vegetarians, because they're always going at right. it. Yeah. I said, do you want to know what that looks like to a scientist? Here it is. Hmm. If, if you're a vegetarian because you don't like killing animals, and so you have a humane mouse trap in your basement, okay, that's honorable, right? And you trap the mouse and you release it into the wild. 
where it is guaranteed to be eaten by owls <laughs> and all manner of predator woodland creatures. Whereas they're safest in your basement. Yeah. <laughs> in your basement. You just leave them there. So, oh. <laughs> so there's a lot of decision making that we think is deeply thought out that in fact isn't. I just want to. And so the book is riddled. With examples. Oh, I love that. this. I, I love this concept. Opinion. I want oh, you to inform your own opinion more deeply. No, right. that's great. It comes out next Tuesday. I'm ordering that as soon as it as I can order that. Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Wow. Um, all right, uh, Doctor, we got to wrap it up here, but we just are reminding everyone of your show, An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies, Part 2, September 23rd at the Kimmel Center, and tickets available at KimmelCulturalCampus.org if you would like to get those. But and you'll finally know what that equation is in that they were attempting to get right in The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And per your suggestion, we are playing you out with a Space Oddity now. So thank you, Doctor. It's great to talk you to gotta you. You got to do it. Okay. appreciate it. Doctor yeah. Neil deGrasse. Tyson, uh, I love talking to that man. You could do four hours. No oh problem. my God, you could just go on and on talking to him. And it's, I, I did read one of his books. Uh, it's uh, Letters to an Astrophysicist. Yes. Because some of his more um, academic things are way over my head, would yeah, be too I'd much. I have to tap out. But it's, uh, it's just him answering letters to people. And so he writes for, you know, the average person as well. And he does that often. Yep. Like, you know, on his social media accounts, well, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll take it down. And I, I always yeah. love, it's like, a, a, oh, okay, this is a science fiction movie that I, I wonder, I hope he likes it. Like, yeah, like yeah, I need to get yeah. the stamp of approval. Yep. Uh, that's going to be a great show uh, at the Kimmel Center. 